Hello, and welcome back to We Read Theory, a podcast where we read theory so you don't have to. I'm Mark. And I'm Alex. And uh, Alex, you've been paying attention to these uh, caucuses recently? No, I went full ostrich mode, put my head in the ground, and didn't give a fuck about them. Actually, it's, it's, it's fucking sad. It sucks. Everything sucks. I was so hype and ready with Bernie going into the polls uh, you know, with a solid lead, and then them just taking it and completely just like fucking it up yeah the, the, the simple the simplest thing and then actual coin tosses deciding where delegates go in the year of our lord 2020 still well i certainly share your disappointment on the points that you brought up but i have to admit that uh you know i've been writing this episode for a little while now and it's just a, it's a great little uh providence that all these things happened at once, because today we are going to be talking about Manufacturing Consent by Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky, and we're going to be getting in real deep with some Latin American elections and how the media has covered them, and hopefully come away with a better idea of how to watch media uh, about elections specifically and about a bunch of other things afterwards. So, um, I don't know, have you ever heard of Manufacturing Consent before? Uh, the book? No. No. Have you heard the term before? Yes, specifically in regards to the assassination of Qasem Soleimani. How um, no one had ever really heard of him in the U.S. apart from like I don't know twenty DSA members, and then he was killed, and the mainstream media ran a bunch of stuff that said, "Oh, this guy was the worst. He was awful. He hung gay people. He did this. He did that. He committed atrocities." And then I was like, "Oh, so I guess it was good." Because they were told so. Yeah, and uh, to, to my knowledge, the term manufacturing consent does have its origins with this particular work. And um, it kind of discusses at its core, it, it tries to, it doesn't necessarily try to answer this question for the entire bit, but at least the first part of it um, is trying to answer a central question, which is, well, what do you think is the best way to determine the motive of someone's actions, specifically of like a media outlet? determine the motive yeah well how do, how do you determine what exactly it is they're trying to do so i mean i i look at what their overall goal was like what what's what's the overall goal of cn right to yeah. generate money for its shareholders okay and they can do that by you know generating outrage and uh, anything that drives viewership so i'd say they were more inclined to um, produce news that's more sensationalist, and so I would say that that's that's their motive for the aforementioned reasons. Yeah, I think you're I think you're actually uh, getting at it pretty well um, in line with what Herman and Chomsky would have said. Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky argue in Manufacturing Consent that the motives that drive the actions of the mass media can be explained through the construction of a model. Essentially, you ask if this was the motive, what would be the action? And if you consistently predict correctly, then your model is probably pretty accurate. The central argument of manufacturing consent is that, though there are exceptions, the American media machine largely adheres to a propaganda model which serves the interests of the country's financial elites and the government. Far from conspiracy theorists, Herman and Chomsky argue that stories are reported or ignored or framed in a specific way, not through a system of direct coercion of media outlets by the government and elites, but instead through the indirect coercion of simple market forces. The market exerts its force on the media in a number of ways, outlined in Herman and Chomsky's five filters. You ready to hear about the five filters? Oh, I'd love nothing more. Okay. Filter one, size, ownership, and profit of the mass media. For the first half of the 19th century in Britain, local radical newspapers raised class consciousness in their general area. The owners of large papers were naturally wealthier than those of smaller local papers and wanted to protect their wealth by preventing the spread of radical ideas. But the initial efforts to raise the cost of doing businesses through uh, legal avenues like raising taxes and imposing fines proved totally insufficient. Enter the free market. As technology advanced through the 19th century, the material cost of doing business increased. The number of copies a paper needed to sell to stay afloat likewise increased, and larger papers with wealthier owners weathered these new obstacles, where smaller papers just couldn't. The rise of media stocks in the modern era has exacerbated this problem. Now, media outlets don't just have to cover their costs, 
They're beset on all sides by their shareholders, who put immense pressure on the media to turn over as large profits as possible. Loosening of restrictions on the concentration of media sources means that medium-sized outlets are in danger of being brought up by larger ones if they can't compete monetarily. In short, media outlets are large businesses and behave like large businesses, improving their product when it's profitable for their shareholders to do so, and picking profit over quality when those two goals conflict. Yeah. That's, <laughs> I, I don't know what to say to that. you got to give me something I disagree with. Yeah, fair. All right, well, let's go into filter two then. Filter two is the advertising license to do business. So not all, but most of the news media we consume today is accompanied by ads. The inclusion of ads is good for business because outlets can provide their product for a reduced or no cost to the end user. This means that people or companies who buy ads can effectively dictate what is allowed to be aired. Media outlets are encouraged to produce content that advertisers want to associate their products with, that viewers likely to buy those products will want to watch, and that keep those viewers in a buying, you know, kind of positive mood. So you want to keep it relatively light on the content sometimes. So content that reinforces the power of large companies, that caters to viewers with more spending power, and that keeps a lighthearted uh, tone is generally selected for when possible. So basically, if you're if you're poor, your uh, you know, your voice really doesn't matter because it's not valuable to advertisers. Yeah, because there's no point in trying to sell your products. You're not going to buy them anyway because you don't have the money. Absolutely. And revolutionary ideas aren't really you know um, they look, don't looked favorably upon because the I mean the yeah, advertisers I mean, are the exact people they would be railing against. Yeah, class consciousness it doesn't really make you want to buy a lot of stuff. Yeah, that's why this show doesn't have have <laughs> sponsors, right? <laughs> Perfect. It's it's we're we're very principled. Oh yeah. All right. Filter three: sourcing mass media news. A media outlet is generally expected to provide more information than it can obtain by its own means, its own investigative journalism. Running a major newspaper or a news network requires the frequent use of sources. For obvious reasons, not all sources are seen as equally objective or reliable. So outlets are going to rely on the ones that are seen as most reliable by the public. This is going to be governments and government agencies, large corporations, think tanks, basically other bureaucracies. What do you mean larger corporations as a means of the source? So, like, if you want to get information on a particular market, then you might trust Apple to tell you about, like, the technology market because they're Apple. You know, of course they know what's going on. Oh, okay. But, of course, Apple has a lot of biases, so you got to think about that. Um, these reliable sources have something of a symbiotic relationship with the media. The media derive their legitimacy from the use of sources, and the sources are recognized as legitimate because the public is familiar with them being cited by their favorite news broadcasts and papers. Uh, there's nothing inherently wrong with this. It's just important to remember that in order for news to be trusted, it generally has to be approved by one of a relatively small number of reliable sources. So you're talking big think tanks, some of the larger corporations out there, or the government that the news media is being broadcast in. Mm -hmm. Filter four. This is a quick one. Flack and enforcers. In simple terms, anything a media outlet does is going to receive some backlash, and that's called flack here. Just as with news itself, flack that's produced by larger corporations or think tanks will have wider reach and will generally be viewed by the public as more factual. And so if you know the government is saying that you're wrong, you know, that's a pretty big black spot on whether or not people are going to trust your news. And filter five, anti-communism. Anti-communism is something of a religion in the United States. Uh, credibility across the political spectrum is at least partially contingent on one's ability to, to appear sufficiently anti-communist. So news media will generally refrain from showing any communist or even socialist regime in a positive light. In the event of U.S.-backed coups abroad, such as the attempted coup of uh, Juan Guaido, or I might be totally mispronouncing that, I hope I'm not, in not Venezuela, uh, or the successful coup against Evo Morales in Bolivia last year, reactions from mainstream media will run the gambit from full support to begrudging support to total silence, you know, at the far left. But outright opposition to these coups is relegated to smaller news outlets with comparatively small funding and outreach. So that's the uh, five major filters that um, media has to pass through and basically be approved by. So as you can see, like what what ultimately it 
comes out the other side of that is going to be, you know, there, there's one major theme between all those five filters, which is that it's people who are the wealthiest and most powerful in whatever society you're in, especially with like a free market based news media is, you know, they basically have to rubber stamp anything that comes out. Otherwise it's just not really going to be run. Would I, it was just, it was just a thought I had. You can like, feel free to have whatever take you on, but would you think like, like a, like a fifth and a half filter might be like pro imperialism, pro imperialism. Um, like, I don't see many people, like, at least, like, the time, the start of the Iraq war, I didn't see... Yeah, like, pro-patriotism. That, that might be more accurate. Yeah, I think that that might go nicely, kind of, along with the anti-communism, because, you know, anti-communism and American patriotism are so closely linked. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that's a really good observation. Um, and I think, I'm sure that Herman and Chomsky would agree with you on that particular point. Yeah. So. Or just maybe, like, nationalism. Well, I guess our in, in, in the U.S. lens, nationalism would be anti-communism. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's I was telling you about a conversation that I had with a good friend of mine the other day where I just I described like the concept of UBI to him. He said, that sounds like communism. And I said, what's wrong with communism? You know, just because, you know, whether you're a communist or not, I think that you should be able to articulate why you feel the way that you do. And he kind of said, well, you know, we fought wars and then kind of trailed off and like, it wasn't a conversation that he particularly wanted to have with me at the time, so I let it go. Uh, but like, you know, it's kind of it's kind of a dogmatic thing that a lot of Americans believe more than really understanding exactly why. Yeah. Now, as well as in 1988, when uh, manufacturing consent was written, the world, especially back then, the world was really split in two in a lot of ways. You had the you, the Soviet sphere of influence and the American sphere of influence. And where an event in the world happens at that time would affect very greatly how it would be perceived by American news media and reported on. When we're talking about people who are the victims of oppression, you have uh, worthy and unworthy victims. And the factor that determines a victim's worthiness has practically nothing to do with the victim themselves, but entirely with the identity and political alignment of their oppressor. Basically, in, is this happening in a Soviet influence state or an American influence state? You know, or aligned. So, as in worthy, as in worthy to be mourned. Yeah, worthy day? to be mourned. Gotcha. So yeah, in short, states aligned or associated with the Soviet Union create worthy victims, and those aligned or associated with the U.S. create unworthy victims. Today, the Soviet Union is obviously not a factor. So states associated with either left-wing populism, or you know, I think we can all agree, Islamism are ones who create worthy victims today. Coverage of worthy and unworthy victims can differ drastically. Wait, so you go go back to the thing you said about Islamism. You said they, Islamism creates worthy, worthy victims. victims? Yeah, so like... Oh, okay, so not the victims of um, like collateral damage from Islamism. No, no, but, because those are our victims. Uh, but like, so, so, like, so the white ones. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, okay. Like, like, like if a U.S. airstrike kills an Iranian wedding party, mm -hmm. you know, that's, those are unworthy victims in this propaganda model. Whereas yeah. if ISIS does a similar thing, those are worthy victims. And those are people that are going to get plastered around the media all the time. And people are going to, everyone's going to know their names. Mm -hmm. And everyone's going to know the gritty details of how they died. Uh, okay. So the first major difference in coverage is that worthy victims receive a great deal more of it. The example that Herman and Chomsky use, uh, at first is a, is Jerzy Papialusko. He was a Polish priest murdered by the Polish police in 1984. Poland fell firmly within the Soviet sphere of influence at this time, so the propaganda model predicts that he would be treated as a worthy victim. Following his murder, the New York Times ran 78 articles discussing his murder, 10 of which were front page articles. Time and Newsweek together ran 16 articles, and CBS News ran 46 news programs. Try to remember those numbers. Four years prior, a Salvadorian priest by the name of Oscar Romero was murdered by his own country's police as well. At the time, El Salvador was governed by a U.S.-backed military junta, so Romero's murder did receive coverage in the same outlets that we just named, but at a markedly lower rate. The New York Times ran only 16 articles covering his murder, of which four were front pagers. Time and Newsweek ran th three articles, and CBS ran 13 news programs. 
So those, those numbers were 78, 16, and 46 for our Polish priest friend. So like a fourth. Yeah, about a fourth. Some, yeah, a, basically a fourth, even less if you, if you look at the New York Times in particular. Um, and Romero was only the most high profile of the unworthy victims. Between 1968 and 1974, there were 72 religious figures who were victims of state-backed violence in Latin America as a whole. Between January 1980 and February 1985, there were 23 in Guatemala alone. In December 1980, four churchwomen who were U.S. citizens were murdered by Salvadorian police. And along with Oscar Romero, the selection of victims in the U.S. in U.S.-backed states numbers 100 exactly. Altogether, they received 57 New York Times articles, of which eight were on the front page, 10 articles from Time and Newsweek, and 37 news programs on CBS. So that's all 100 against 78, 16, and 46, respectively, for the one Polish priest. But the amount of coverage is not the only meaningful difference. Worthy victims have their murders depicted repeatedly and in excruciating details. The coverage is often emotional in nature and is meant to disgust and enrage. The victims' anti-Soviet political leanings are brought center stage, and responsibility for the murder is searched for as high up in the chain of command as possible and connected to specific individuals and groups. In this case, they wanted to, you know, connect his murder all the way to the top of the Soviet high command. In contrast, coverage of unworthy victims tends to be concise and very professional. Little coverage was given to the gruesome details of Oscar Romero's murder, though they were abound. Their murders also tend to be attributed to senseless and faceless violence rather than the actions of specific people. In the case of Oscar Romero, his outspoken criticism of U.S. foreign policy, the military junta, and of the right-wing paramilitary death squads who ultimately killed him was buried along with his support of left-wing rebel groups who he considered to be acting in self-defense. Instead, he was depicted as criticizing violence from extremists on both the right and the left. So, you know, it's kind of like, oh no, like, we need to stop this senseless violence instead of these are the people who are responsible. In short, coverage of unworthy victims attempts to build the veneer of compassion while preventing any connection by the audience to the larger political forces at play. So would that more be like um, Lockheed Martin running uh, campaigns about, not Lockheed Martin, maybe like Smith & Wesson okay. or something, running a campaign saying, hey, we need safer schools? Um, kind of, yeah. And I mean, I mean, you see this from like the NRA, absolutely, where like they talk about gun violence as this like bad thing, but it's like there's no there's no connection to larger political forces. It's it's all it's kind of hand waved as inevitable violence, and the only solution is to buy the products they're pushing. So yeah, <laughs> actually, it's a great connection. So it'd be uh, more like John Oliver. Um looking at all the bad effects of capitalism without actually turning an eye onto the, for the, the, the force that's actually affecting all of these things. Well, of course. And I mean, that's that's kind of very central to the whole concept of manufacturing consent. <laughs> like, God, why are companies violating the spirit of all of these laws and just paying attention and following them nominally? nominally uh, what, what could possibly be the, like, the root cause of all this? You were really trying to drag John Oliver on this show right now. I, did I do this? Have I done this before? I guess not. No, just right now. No, I mean, regardless, I, I, I'm I'm a very anti-late night talk show person. That's fair enough. Also anti-SNL, host John Belushi. So at the beginning of this episode, we talked a little bit about the Iowa caucus last night and kind of how that's been portrayed. And the meat of what I want to talk to you about today, because none of that was the meat, obviously, um, is what Herman and Chomsky have to say about three Latin American elections that happened in the 1980s and how the media reacted to them what the facts were about them and how we can kind of use them as a model going forward looking at new elections that happen in the future coverage of elections follows essentially the same pattern as coverage of political violence with the nature of the coverage depending more on the state's political alignment than the actual details of the election itself Herman and Chomsky analyzed this trend through the elections in the early 1980s in three Central American nations. In El Salvador and Guatemala, U.S.-backed regimes held elections in 1982 and 84, respectively. In Nicaragua, under U.S.-opposed Sandinista control, elections were held in 1985. And before we can continue, we have to establish some basic facts 
about what makes a democracy legitimate. On the surface, the fact that citizens vote and that their votes translate to the distribution of political power to certain individuals and parties is what makes a legitimate election. But myriad factors surrounding the election can prevent its results from accurately representing the will of the nation's people, even when those people are nominally allowed to vote, and even when those votes, you know, technically count. In all three of these states, the elections were underscored by a pattern of political violence. Because voting is an open act of political expression, the prevalence of political violence can easily prevent voters from showing up to the polls out of fear for their safety. Voters must also understand what it is they're voting for, so rights like freedom of speech and of the press, as well as a high literacy rate, are essential to legitimate elections. And finally, voters can only vote for parties and candidates that appear on the ballot that they're given, so the freedom to organize into political parties and participate in elections is likewise essential to a legitimate election. And uh, we'll get into the details of how each regime stacks up when it comes to the fundamental rights of its citizens and how it may affect their elections now. But spoilers, Nicaragua, the anti-U.S. regime, basically succeeds at least partially providing these rights where the other two don't even really try. Number one, free speech and assembly. In El Salvador, these rights were formally suspended due to a state of siege. Uh, they were only lifted shortly before the election, and even then the populace was not informed, and the restrictions were reinstated after anyway. So, you know, they had free speech, but they didn't know until after the election anyway, mm -hmm. when they'd been taken away anyway. So, it doesn't really count, in my opinion. And the military killed without recourse and displayed bodies as a means of intimidation of the masses. So, even if you have free speech, if that's happening, you know, you're not going to speak your mind. In Guatemala... The existence of civil defense patrols effectively destroyed these rights. Violators were interrogated and often murdered, and the army which oversaw refused to indict its own members. Rights were instated three days prior to the election, but an environment of fear prevented serious rhetorical exchange regardless. In Nicaragua, speech had been somewhat constrained until six months prior to the elections. So six months, that's much longer. However, this constraint was not marked by state terror and massacres. People were dying, but mostly at the hands of the U.S.-backed Contras. Uh, the people clearly did not feel the same level of intimidation as they freely approached and reproached political candidates that they disliked on Election Day, who were at, like, polling places. So basically you have a partial condition met in Nicaragua and not at all in Guatemala and El Salvador. Get ready to hear that a bunch more times. You got it. Freedom of the press. All oppositional newspapers had been shut down by means of violence, murder, bombings in El Salvador. At least 30 journalists had been killed in the lead up to the election. In Guatemala, there were no news outlets reflecting indigenous views or anti-government views, and 48 journalists had been killed in the lead up. In Nicaragua, multiple major news sources of opposition news were allowed to exist with some constraints. No journalists had been murdered by the government, and it should be noted that Nicaragua was actually under foreign attack at this time. So their rebel problem was not internal rebels, but foreign-backed rebels. John S. Nichols pointed out that the situation in Nicaragua is not much different than that in the U.S. under the 1917 Espionage Act, which shut down over 100 papers thought to be subversive at the time for the lead-up to the um, elections that were upcoming in, like, 1920. Um, so keep that in mind when you are kind of comparing these like Latin American elections to like American elections. So once again, partial presence, not complete presence, but partial presence of these rights in Nicaragua, not at all in Guatemala or El Salvador. Okay. Freedom of organization of intermediate groups. So like political parties and organizations, stuff like that. In El Salvador, intermediate organizations like the teachers unions were weakened by murders of their members. Uh, this is also go. This also rings true. Oh yeah, we'll we'll get to the actual like murders later. Um, this is um, also true of like opposition political parties in Guatemala. It was actually illegal to organize for illicit purposes. The meaning of illicit is a matter of press for any army to decide. You know, any army officer can just like decide that they don't like it, and that's illicit. Uh, unions and professional organizations who spoke messages against the government were labeled as such, illicit. Uh, 
Uh, in Nicaragua, it was actually they actually promoted local organizing, which shot up in participation rates during this time. So there was quite a bit of organization, both pro and opposed to the Sandinista government. Um, so condition met pretty well in Nicaragua. Once again, you know, not totally, but pretty well. Not by El Salvador, not by Guatemala. Number four, freedom to organize parties and field candidates. The left Democratic Party, known as FDR, was driven underground in El Salvador. Its leaders were seized, kidnapped. The army published a list of 138 traitors who included all left of center politicians in the country. And FDR was explicitly not allowed to participate. And it also was not allowed to campaign on the issue of ending the violent conflict in the country by negotiating with rebels. So even if you're allowed to vote, you can't vote against the war and you can't vote for the left. They outlawed, they outlawed voting against a specific issue? No, but if you were a party that was campaigning on that, then you wouldn't have been able to actually run or campaign. So effectively, yeah. That's so odd that they just... So, so you... Okay, so you can't do what you want. Okay, so it's not free. Okay. No, that doesn't count. And that's El Salvador. In Guatemala, uh, I left... I'm sorry, just like, how is one specific thing? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, well... In Guatemala, the left was totally absent from elections due to illicit association, like we discussed in the last point. And even center parties, like the Christian Democrats, had suffered scores of murders. The Christian Democrat candidate for president actually did win the 1984 election in Guatemala. Uh, it was a guy named uh, Vicinio Carreza. Carrezo. Not Carreza. Uh, and at the time, he had already survived at least three assassination attempts. And in his election bid, he chose not to pursue land reform, which was the chief concern of the Guatemalan population, because he knew that the Guatemalan army wasn't into it. The field of the Nicaraguan election was relatively diverse, and parties denouncing the Sandinistas were allowed even to promote negotiations with the Contras. The FSLN, so the Sandinista party, did take advantage of its incumbency, but not to a particularly great extent, and must much less so than those in El Salvador and Guatemala. So once again, condition met in Nicaragua definitely better than in Guatemala or El Salvador. And finally, get ready for these numbers. Absence of state terror and a climate of fear. For two and a half years leading up to the 1982 election, the El Salvadorian army killed approximately 700 civilians every single month. In, in uh, reference to Guatemala, I have a quote from the book directly. Uh, specifically from America's Watch, writing in early 1985. Tortures, killings, and disappearances continue at an extraordinary rate, and millions of peasants remain under the strict scrutiny and control of the government through the use of civil patrols and model villages. Guatemala remains, in short, a nation of prisoners. Mm. That sounds pretty convincing for climate of fear. In Nicaragua, citizens weren't really killed by the government, definitely not in numbers like that. And as we discussed before, civilians were killed in the fighting, but mostly by Contras, who were once again U.S.-backed and not particularly uh, popular in the country itself. Yeah, and just like a really cool side little factoid, um, the U.S.-backed Contras were U.S.-backed because, quote, uh, by the Kerry Committee, uh, payments to drug traffickers by the U.S. State Department of Funds authorized by the Congress for Humanitarian Assistance to the Contras in some cases, after the traffickers had been indicted by federal law enforcement agencies on drug charges, and in others, while traffickers were under active investigation. So, kind of cool. Yeah, kinda you know, cool. I actually, yeah, I actually, you've jogged my memory a little bit. That's ultimately what led to Iran-Contra, was because um, they couldn't be peddling drugs to fund the Contras, and so that's how they ended up with the Reagan administration and Ali North selling weapons to the Iranians to, to kind of gather the money to then finance the Contras with. Interesting. Yeah. Good stuff. Awesome. And then, yeah, real quick, um, coercion packages. So basically, whether or not people are actually coerced into voting, or whether it makes sense to assume that they're coerced into voting. Um, between the three states, it was actually, it was actually necessary to vote uh, like by law in El Salvador and Guatemala and not in Nicaragua. So keep that in mind when we talk about the media kind of reporting on it and talking about what it means that people are showing up to the polls. See, I, that's, that's been brought up in the U.S. to like um, making it um, 
mandatory to vote because so many people, like especially in the general, like what is it only like thirty to forty percent of the people no, who it's, can vote? It's not thirty percent. It's voting? it's it's round about fifty percent. It's round about half. Okay, well, well it depends still, on the election. In that case, obviously. like people I know the twenty sixteen like, election was a low turnout election, in particular. Uh, maybe that's what I'm thinking of then. But it, um, pe- people were saying um, the the idea had been brought up that like uh, complicit vote, vote voting was or mandatory voting. Yeah. Um, as an idea to solve this, was it? Are you saying like mandatory voting is necessarily bad? And for what? No, reasons? it's not that it's necessarily bad. But if it is illegal not to vote, then obviously the fact that people are showing up and voting doesn't necessarily mean that they care about the election. It means that they're trying not to deal with the legal consequences. And likewise, if if it's not illegal not to vote, if it's perfectly okay to stay home, and still 70, 80, 90 percent of the country shows up, that is very meaningful. Unless, of course, you have reason to believe that they're being coerced some way outside of the law. Gotcha. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. All right, so let's talk about the media coverage of all three countries. In El Salvador, elections were framed as under attack by leftist rebels as a result of the kind of climate of violence surrounding them. Remember, there was a civil war going on in El Salvador at the time, but no quotation from rebels was actually included to prove this in the reporting, and nor was there any actual leftist rebel disruption of the election. So this framing is, you know, pretty much a falsification. There's no evidence that, that was really a uh, big problem. In El Salvador, much significance was placed on turnout, like we just discussed, even though voting was required to do, and uh, and to not do so was actually considered a form of treason. Nicaragua actually had a higher voter turnout in relation to its population than El Salvador without actually requiring voting. So keep that in mind as well. Leftist parties were boycotting the election at the time, and those boycotts were framed as indicative of their anti-democracy rather than any wrongdoing on the part of the government conducting the elections, even though, as we discussed, their leaders were being killed. You know, it was a total climate of violence. I wouldn't have run in the election if I was a leftist in El Salvador at the time either. Statements on the role of the military in elections were chalked up to basically, you know, they say they have no role besides protecting the voters. And that's really just taken on its face. Uh, and that's kind of silly because the military had, in fact, been running death squads and terror campaigns on the populace for years prior. 700 civilians a month for two and a half years leading up to it. And, you know, once again, voter turnout was considered a movement against continued conflict, even though no anti-war party was even on the ballot and fighting continued after the election. So I don't know where the hell you get that from. The U.S. wasn't as directly involved in Guatemala as it was in El Salvador, but but the media still glossed over oppressions of the regime. Elections were generally just assumed to be legitimate in spite of a lot of population relocation and these civil defense patrols which do the same basic job as the death squads did in um, El Salvador. Benicio Carrezo, who we talked about a second ago, the guy who ended up winning the 1984 election in Guatemala, was lauded as like a break from military rule, even though civilian presidents had been elected in the past under military rule and were recognized accurately as military puppets. And Carrezo himself expressed doubts that he was actually being voted into serious power and that he wasn't just another military puppet. So to just take that on face is, I think, a little bit silly. He himself was concerned that he was a military puppet Absolutely. without his knowledge? Mm-hmm. Well, not without his knowledge, but he was he was basically saying, like, I'm, I'm about to be elected. I'm not sure that they're actually going to give me power when I try to, you know, do my job. Oh, so you just be a figurehead. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Mass killings of civilians in Guatemala had occurred, but they were generally justified as being related to the successes against leftist insurgents, which is, you know, a very cynical framing. It's very vague. Um, and the reality is that what they're, they're saying it that way to gloss over the fact that the government was killing huge numbers of civilians. And sources like America's Watch and the Guatemalan Bishops' Conference reported that necessary conditions for a free and fair election were not present. These sources were totally ignored. Or, you know, when they weren't ignored, they were they were called, like, you know, they've received criticism for being involved with, like, leftist politics and stuff. Mm-hmm. So, you know, kind of, trying to, kind of trying to downplay. This is all very different from how, uh, how the media reported on the election in Nicaragua, almost the exact opposite. 
Time magazine noted that there were no official American observers at the Nicaraguan election as an argument against its credit, even though all that really proves is that the U.S. has a lot of power and doesn't actually like the election. It doesn't actually prove anything about the election itself. There were quite a few unofficial and very qualified observers, uh, including a Dutch kind of center-right aligned delegation, which concluded that the election was significantly more free and fair in uh, Nicaragua than in the other two countries we've been discussing. There was also an Irish inter-party delegation and a delegation from the Latin American Studies Association, and both of those delegations agreed with the Dutch delegation. They thought that the Nicaraguan election, you know, in line with the facts that we've just discussed, was much more legitimate than the other two. A lot of the coverage depicted the people participating in the election as very apathetic, not really caring, Oh, the Sandinistas won, you know, big surprise. No one saw that coming, even though, like, mechanically, the election was a much more legitimate election. They actually had secret ballots. That was not the case in El Salvador and Guatemala. And, like, this idea that, like, oh, people are showing up amid a climate of fear wasn't really framed as, like, look at these people doing a democracy in spite of all this crazy stuff. It's like, look at all this crazy violence going on this must mean the election is legitimate. So the exact same factors have opposite meanings depending on whether the election is occurring in what Herman and Chomsky would call a client state versus a non-client state. Hmm. That makes sense to me, I guess. So are there, are there any um, international events that have occurred recently that kind of make you think of that? Because I certainly have one in particular that makes me think of that. Yeah, we're thinking about the same thing. Just go for yeah, it. We're talking, the, yeah, of course, the... the the coup in Bolivia, in particular, is a really great example of this. Because, I mean, even just the lack of the use of the word coup, like, the silence really is deafening. Do you want, do you want to like, give a little background on it for everyone who knows? Yeah, that? yeah, R real quick. Um, a lot of people have been talking about this in relation to the Iowa caucus and basically saying Evo Morales was deposed by a U.S.-backed coup for much less than what's going on in Iowa. And I have to agree. Uh, and what basically happened was in... Bolivia, the way that they do elections is that if you get 10 points more than the second place winner in the first round of voting, then you just win it outright. And there was a slight discrepancy and a slight delay between their quick count and their official count. And so basically the OAS, the Organization of American States, which is a U.S.-backed, you know, I think right-wing organization, uh, basically like demanded that they do like a recount or they do another election. Evo said, you know what, okay, we can do another election. And they said, no, never mind. And the, a bunch of military leaders brought Evo Morales into a room. They said, we need you to resign. We're going to have a bunch of your other guys resign. Um, you know, that sounds like a coup to me. Um, Evo funny. fled the country. He's currently chilling in Mexico right now. And the country is led by an interim government, which has engaged in some very unambiguously fascist behaviors, such as carrying a giant, like, person-sized Bible into the presidential palace and proclaiming, the Bible has returned to the presidency, um, and the current interim president has expressed some very racist uh, views about the indigenous peoples of Bolivia. And of course, there's been a absolutely been a climate of fear, a climate of violence following the coup, specifically against the lives and property of indigenous peoples in Bolivia. So this is like textbook U.S.-backed coup in Central or South America. And we bring this up because elections are coming up in Bolivia. The interim government was ultimately set up to hold elections, and we're going to see them happen on May 3rd of this year. And I think that it's really important to take these points that we've talked about, about media coverage of election into account when we listen to them. So if you hear people talking about apathy, about how the climate of, you know, violence delegitimizes the election. If you see them, you know, you're probably actually not going to see that because it's a U.S.-backed government. So what you're more likely to see is things like talking about how people are really excited to get into the, like, um, political process. The lines are so long. Look at how excited everyone is. Look at people are braving these violent conditions. It's my understanding that MAS, Mor uh, Morales, is... Um, kind of left-wing party is going to be taking part in elections. So I don't think you're going to be seeing a lot of news about how, like, they're boycotting the elections because they're not. 
Uh, but if they were, you would certainly expect to see that used as proof that they don't even believe in democracy in the first place. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I would just say look out for a lot of the same kinds of things that we've talked about in this. Uh, because I certainly have been witnessing a lot of that, especially in relation to Evo Morales' coup or the attempted coup in Venezuela. I remember reading an article recently where the boycotting of the elections uh, by, you know, opposition parties to Maduro's government were used as evidence of the fact that the elections were illegitimate, whereas in the case of El Salvador and Guatemala, as we discussed, the boycotting by left-wing parties was, you know, proof of their own anti-democracy. So it's a total double standard. And just be on the lookout for those kinds of signs, I guess. So there's one thing to take away from this episode is that it's important to be directly as directly involved in your government as possible, whether that be caucusing, canvassing, uh, following the news, and uh, the way it makes democracy makes its way around the world. Yeah, absolutely. Being on the ground and witnessing your own democracy happening firsthand, being familiar with what the mechanics of your election are, and thinking about them in terms of, you know, do these mechanics actually serve a free and fair election well? Are my fundamental rights present? Do I actually feel like it's materially possible for a party of any kind of ideology to run in this election? Or is there a limited field? These are all things to consider when you consider the legitimacy of an election. I do have some thoughts on that, but we're way over time. No, no, no. Let's go. Oh, I mean, I mean, you can't have any kind of party run in a free and fair election. You know, there's certain kinds of fascist parties that are going to, you know, stomp on sure, the, and it's, the, 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 the rights and the freedom to, you know, have their own elections of, um, you know, uh, disenfranchised peoples. So. Yeah, really, your big enemy when it comes to this thing is, like, coming up with sweeping rules. So it's like, oh, if they don't do this period or they do this period, that means this. Like, look at the specifics, use your noggin, and, and, and say, you know, this thing kind of looks similar in one country to another, but maybe some of the specifics are different. And so just, you know, be very specific about what's going on when you when you kind of analyze elections, definitely. Yeah, there's nothing uh, bad ever happened from learning history. So, yeah. So this was actually only about halfway through um, manufacturing consent that we got today, and we're already way over the time that we normally like to allocate for episodes. Um, in the second half of the book, Herman and Chomsky discuss a KGB plot to kill the Pope and the Indochina Wars in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. Super duper interesting stuff. Um, Obviously, we couldn't get to it today because that would have just been an impossibly long episode for us. So if you're listening to this and that all sounds super interesting to you as it does to me and you want to hear about it, then, you know, tweet at us. If we get probably one tweet at us, uh, you know, we'll do it. We'll, We'll cover the second half of the book. And um, probably not the next episode because it is February already, and I would really like to uh, cover something having to do with the Black Panthers before the end of the month. Oh, that be so. Yeah, so probably nice. some, probably some, uh, some Huey P. Newton. I literally just oh wait, we listen to the same podcast. That's yeah, why we I'm do. remembering this. We listen to all the same podcasts, so we know all the same people. Oh so, my yeah, god. I, um, so yeah, if Indochina Wars sound interesting to you, tweet at us and let us know. And we'll get to tweet back at you, say no more, fam. <laughs> you mean, I, <laughs> <laughs> I won't be saying that, but tweet at us anyway. Thanks. Love you guys.